My name is Sylvie McAdam. I'm from the Big River Reserve, but it's called Atehamik Sagaikan. I am a fluent Cree speaker. I also write in Cree. I'm doing my the final my final classes in law, so that's what I do. And I also work with uh, different bands in in Saskatchewan to begin re-implementing and reintegrating Cree laws back into their governance structure. And one of the biggest tri uh, reserves that I'm working with right now is Big Island. But I'm also working with, uh, I'll be working with uh, the File Hills Police Service to begin um, teaching the Cree laws to their members. So that's one of the stuff that I'm working on. Wow. Yeah. Uh, well, there's a lot of unpacking in, in what you just said there. It's been, perhaps you can just uh, speak about these laws um, in, in the way that, how did you learn them? And how they differ from the laws that we're up against when we do talk treaty with a non-Indigenous person. Okay. I think for Indigenous people, you need to go back and speak to your elders in the community. You need to understand where it is that you come from. Who are your ancestors? How did our warriors and our women uh, come to this place in time? How did our laws uh, play a significant role at the time of treaty signing? So I'm very fortunate. My parents never went to residential school, never attended. So their knowledge is quite intact. And, and then when you look at my grandparents, my mother's parents never attended residential school, neither did their parents. So I'm very fortunate that knowledge is still being passed down. And in my, my father's uh, family, there's sporadic um, where we could find people that went to residential school, but basically the knowledge is still intact. I could tell you um, my father's uh, heritage, the lineage, right up before treaty signing. I, I could name because I've been taught that. And just the same with my mother. Now, in saying that, when I when I was growing up and I was learning these things and my parents were telling me, you have to follow these laws, these are our laws, I took it for granted that people, uh, other Cree people had that, you know, understanding. So when I started speaking about them in law school, um, people were like, what? And I'm like, yeah, we have our own laws. And they're like, really? So. The first year of law school, I started to question things. I came out of there thinking, well, where are our laws? You know, we didn't run around lawless. So I started talking to elders, and I've been so fortunate um, to speak to Leona Titusis, my parents, Francis and Juliet McAdam, and uh, Jimmy Mayo, Alma, and Simon Kaitoihat. So they've really um, formed my thinking especially my parents, they really uh, formulated in, um, I'm a good translator. So I took their, their knowledge and I translated it into English. And what I, what I came up with over the years is uh, the laws translated into English. So those laws, I've, I've been invited to speak at various conferences about these laws. Now, now there's something happening. There's something happening around uh, amongst indigenous nations. Um, I think there's an empowerment happening. I'm sorry, do I go on? No, I mean, that, no, that's good, but you were giving me a thought. I was like, yes, oh. there is something happening. Right? Yeah. So I, I do sense that, and um, well, you know, actually, why don't you just keep going on with that idea? If there is something happening, how are those laws, I mean, how is that knowledge a part of that? You know, how, are, how is that empowering? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll expand a little more on, at the time of treaty signing, I'll tell you the history of, of how the laws came to be. The story behind this is, you, you, you know Wisakitsak, the character of Wisakitsak. Wisakitsak was told by the creator to 
to go to an area called Ogumawati. Ogumawati is in the Cypress Hills area. And when he got there, he was told to climb those hills. And at the top of those hills, he sang four songs. And one of those songs is a woman's song. And when he was done singing those songs, the Creator gave him the laws to take to the people to follow for all time. So when the Europeans came, um, when the Europeans came, they, they came with their laws. And then when, when the Cree leaders, Ogimawak, went to meet with them, they had their laws to follow. And for example, one, there's two very significant laws. In, in, in Canadian law, they're called actus reus. That's the similarity that I found. When you break a law, a human law, it's called pastahuin. Pastahuin um, is the breaking of a Cree law against human beings. And this is the law that covers incest, adultery, murder, suicide. Those are all the different laws. And then there's the other law, it's the breaking of, um, it's called Otsiniwin. It's the breaking of the Creator's law against anything other than a human being. And that covers environment, hunting, earth laws, and the animal laws, and these things that human, break, human beings break in regards to uh, the, the Creator's creations. And in all this, in all, in all of this um, laws, they're called mantowingyuna because that translates into creator laws. And then from the creator laws, they're called wiasuuna. These wiasuuna are the, uh, the ones I just described, pastahuin and ochtiniwin. Those are the human laws. And then amongst those Uyasuruna are um, other laws. There's four elements that were given laws. That was the earth laws, the human laws, the spiritual laws, and um, the animal and the plant laws, all those things. So those are the things I started to learn about. And I started putting um, the translation from Cree to English. Now, at the time of treaty signing, there was um, there was different roles within um, the governance structure, the leadership. There was the hereditary chiefs, and what we what they were called at that time were okitsetau skuok. They were roughly translated. They would be called clan mothers, but each tribe had them. And these clan mothers were the guardians or the keepers of these laws because they were the ones that raised the children. They were similar to uh, judges. That's, that's the closest that I could come up with in translation. Now, these Okitsutau school at the time of treaty signing didn't go and sit there. But when the day was done, the men, the chiefs of that day, would go back and go speak with these Okitsutau school. They did not have the authority or the permission to agree to anything unless they went back and spoke to these women. Usually, when the matters are not too serious, say if a, a child breaks a law, seven women would be called to deal with it, and they would um, decide the appropriate remedy and then after that's decided, then a consequence came with it. The community would, would decide what the remedy is, and then there would be a consequence. And then in very serious matters, such as the time of treaty signing, there was nine women that were called upon because it was a very serious matter. This treaty signing was not uh, they did not go into it lightly. So when, when they used the nine women, it meant that it was very serious. And these two, two other women that were um, 
added to the seven who were very knowledgeable and gifted. They were warrior women. They did not come into these uh, matters very lightly and they were called upon because they were recognized for their knowledge and their gifts and, and uh, the laws, their understanding of the laws. Now, so when that happened and the treaties were being negotiated and, and agreed to, these women were in a background and this is not something you he read about in the history books. That's because at the time the Europeans were, were, were writing their version of it, but in the background over here were the women. And this is the role that they had to play at the time of treaty signing. Now, today, our, our biggest challenge is recognizing that this governance structure is not ours. It's an Indian Act imposed system of governance. Our governance is under the treaties at the time of signing with the, uh, the Queen. We had an Mao and his headman and his Okitsitao Skok. That was our, our system of, of governance. And over here, they had their system of governance as well. So we've left this behind. Over, over time and over history, and these laws still sit with these individuals, with these, these, that governance structure over here. And, and it's still there. It's not extinguished, as, as uh, the, the, the Canadian system of law would say. It's not extinguished. It still exists. So in saying that, um, for my community, uh, the elders have said there'll be a time in Cree, they say, Kayaz, a long time ago. And I've heard this while I was growing up. The elders said that the knowledge keepers, the keepers of the laws, of these laws would, would awaken at a time when, when the Cree people, the indigenous people would need them. So, the elders are thinking that now is that, that time is coming. That time is slowly coming because the earth is be being damaged. It's, it's um, the, the laws are, are being awakened. So, but that's, that's another topic. That, that's a, a whole learning process that someone needs to go and, and uh, appropriately um, access through the, through the elders. Now, one of the things that uh, I speak, you hear, you hear about people saying that uh, the legal system uh, doesn't work for us. It's true. It, it really doesn't work for us. The Canadian legal system, um, we have a high incarceration, incarceration rate among Indigenous people. And as soon as you can accept that the system doesn't work, I find when people accept that, they can step back and say, okay, well, what, do, what did work? And that's what um, uh, Big Island is doing, Big Island Cree Nation. They're stepping back and saying, well, what's going on in our community? How come it's not working? So they're addressing suicide and family issues and criminal matters by teaching their people about these laws, about the Cree laws and the Nihio laws. Um, and so, you know, if you're, if you're going to go into the process of being a leader, you can follow the European system of law but when you look at yourself, when you look at your heritage, you're always going to be an indigenous nation of this country, of this, this nation here. You'll always be indigenous in the eyes of your heritage, your ancestors, your relatives, your family. That's never going to change. So when I, when I speak to young people about leadership and the structure of governance, and I hear people say the treaties are, are broken. They're not 
broken. They're not, they're still there. We just haven't had the full impact of the treaties. You have to, I have to challenge people when they say, I'm a treaty person. Are you really? You know, you're, we're all under the Indian Act. Is it, are we, are we treaty people under the Indian Act? Or are we treaty people under the, the treaties themselves? There's acts of treaty under the Indian Act, but not real, we're not really under the umbrella of a treaty because we've stepped away from it through the Indian Act. Um, even the word Ogimao um, is chief under the treaties. And if you look at it under the Indian Act, they're called Ogimahkan. That literally translates into a fake chief under the Indian Act. Now, I invite um, people to take a look at um, the Business Corporations Act, the Canadian Business Corporations Act, and look at the definition of municipality under there. The definition of municipality covers um, a reserve. So the Canadian um, system looks upon our current chief and council as uh, a municipality, like a mayor and council. This is what this act implies. That's what it infers. Now, if people are going to um, think about uh, how they're going to view the future, the future of these laws, the future of the generations to come, and that's the process of the treaty signing. The treaty signing said that it's going to go on forever to the generations to come. So how, you, how are you going to do that as a leader? Are you going to do it under the Canadian legal system? Or are you going to um, follow the laws of the, the treaties? And in, in, in saying that, um, I speak to uh, young people about the laws of suicide. You know, I don't, I don't think uh, our people really um, under, understand the, the, our Cree laws that govern suicide. When, when we speak of suicide, it's called kanpaisot. Um, it means, literally, it translates into um, to kill oneself. Now, with, with the elders and what I've learned speaking with them, they've said that when you break that law and you leave this world, you literally um, have to pay for it. When I say pay for it, it means to be punished or to suffer for it from the Creator because you've murdered, you've committed murder. That's the consequence for it. And that's the, the price that you pay when you commit suicide. Now, at the, at the time of um, treaty signing, it was unheard of, it was unheard of um, sexual abuse and incest and, and all these sexual related offenses that are, are so common now amongst uh, a lot of people. There's no word in Cree for it. There's no word in Cree for, for rape and incest and all these sexual offenses. There's no word for it. Because it, no, um, it was unheard of, it was almost non-existent, because these laws um, were the ones that uh, guided the people. These were the laws that they followed. When, when I started learning about the, the European system of law, um, a lot of the history of the common law comes from a many, many years of an evolution uh, um, of a, a legal system that went through so many thousands of years of change. But when you really look further and further, their laws were, were um, came from the Bible, from 
Moses and all these, you know, thou shall not steal, those kind of things. And our laws here were given to us from the Creator. And when we follow them, when, when our people had followed them at the time of treaty signing, those were the laws that well, spoke to how uh, the families would raise their children. There's a law even on uh, how to raise children. The law of raising children. And then there's the law of wahkutuin. There's kinship. That's kinship. How you relate it to everybody. There's certain, even that's a whole process of how to teach your children who they're related to. Nobody ever speaks about that anymore. I, I, I've, the elders that I speak to, um, they're really concerned about that because now we have first cousins um, having a relationship or, you know, and that creates uh, abnorm abnormal births. And that's what uh, they're really concerned about. If you're going, not going to follow the kinship laws and you're breaking them, there's consequences. And of course, those consequences are abnormal births. And this all, the kinship laws govern um, the male and female lines. It's, very, it's a complicated um, relationship, uh, recognizing how you relate it to each person. And, and how you relate it to them is how you address them. Now, when you're going to play a role in the leadership, it's not just a male leadership line. There's also the female. Now, for example, my, my brother, his children would, would be related differently to me because of the female line versus my, my sister's children. Because my sister and I are of the female line, her children would be like my children. I would be obligated, if anything happens to my sister, to raise her children. That would be my role. Versus my brother's uh, children, they would be of the male line. So I would look at them differently, um, treat them differently. There's a certain respect for them that I, I, I must follow because um, they would be, uh, in Cree, they would be translated like they were my my uh, son-in-laws, my daughter-in-laws. That's how it would translate. So I would have to address them in that manner and with real, uh, a different respect. But if my brother and my other brother, there again, that's the male line. And that's the same with um, my father's um, brother. He would be my little dad. That's how it would translate. It would be a little dad and he would be, um, obligated a certain way to me because I would be his daughter and his children would be my my brothers and my sisters but I can't I can't address my aunties the same way they're like my mother-in-laws so I have to have a certain deference and a different respect for them I can't speak to them the same way now a lot of our people um, don't know that in detail so I've, I've seen um, uncles address nieces that they're not supposed to address. I've seen, um, I've seen um, like very um, severe breaking of the kinship laws and it causes such a, an imbalance and a, a sickness in, in the leadership in, a, in a, the leadership uh, role of, of the community. If you're going to uh, begin a process of providing leadership and governance, then it's not about you as a human being. It's about looking at how you affect people. 
there is a law for respect. Manatsuin, it's called. There is a law for that. And then there's a law for um, obedience and quietness. And those are all, there are so many laws in a Cree culture with the Nihio people that it's much stricter than any European system. It's so, so much more strict. You can't be using drugs and alcohol if you're going to step into the role of leadership. That is such a severe uh, breaking of our laws that there's consequences that follow. And in saying that, oh, I wanted to say that um, when you look at the whole <clears throat> Canadian system of law, you'll, you're not going to get help, like in financial help, to get these Indigenous laws going. Uh, I know that there's communities struggling, but yet you'll get um, the Regina Correctional Center will it just got like $51.5 million to um, build an extension to their, to their center. You know, those, those are the challenges that people uh, come, come up against. And the, one of the biggest challenges is just accepting that there's, there's no financial help to get these laws um, uh, going or to get people to recognize them. It's about um, believing in them yourself. It's about putting them in your life. It's every day making a commitment um, to follow a standard of respect, following kinship, following the laws of how to raise your children, following the laws of, of not drinking and, and doing drugs and not even smoking. And it's a difficult process. I've had many challenges in my own life uh, trying to follow um, these laws in my own life. It's difficult. You're, you're, you're tempted to um, have a cigarette or, you know, those different things that people do, especially for the young people. This is a challenge. Now, um, one of the, the things that, uh, that I talk about to to people is when at the time of treaty signing, we had such a strong attachment to land. A lot of our laws are so connected to the land, our medicines, our water, and the animals, and all these different things are so connected with us as human beings, as indigenous people. Now, a lot of us are, are, have lost uh, an attachment to land. We don't feel the harm being done to the land anymore because we don't follow these laws as much anymore. Nobody really speaks about them as, uh, anymore. And just like any courtroom, any you see these lawyers go into a courtroom, they bow, they follow procedure, there's rules in place. That's the same with Cree laws. If you're going to go uh, seeking out these laws, you have to follow protocol and procedure. And Cree people, and I know that the Soto people and the Lakota and Nakota, the Dene, they all have this process. Something that an, uh, a person said, I went to a conference in December at the College of Law, and his name is Leroy Little Bear. Um, he said, someone asked him, this was during the time when the election was going through the, cons the conservatives and the liberals. Leroy Little Bear said, um, people would go up and ask him, should I go and vote? And he would tell them, if you're for rights, go and vote. But if you're for sovereignty, then don't vote. So one of the processes that I tell people is, if if we're going to exert sovereignty, 
if we're going to say we're a sovereign nation, we can't go to the table and say, here it is, These, this is how we're going to be sovereign by using their laws. You know, it's, it's kind of strange. You can't use their laws to claim sovereignty. They have to use your own laws. And these are uh, the indigenous laws that I speak about. Now, the Indian Act was imposed. It was not done through consultation or consent. That's a well-known fact, of course. Now, if there are still people uh, within every tribe, every reserve in Canada that have a hereditary lineage, my suggestion is and this hasn't happened. I don't know what would happen if it would, people were to go, or follow this suggestion, but I've had elders tell me that the only way to go back to the treaties is to go back to that hereditary line, to go back to that treaty chief. In our reserve, um, uh, the, the lineage is the treaty um, people that first signed treaty, you got to find those ones and find who was the last living um, uh, treaty chief that existed. Now, the challenge for people is to let go of this system, this elected system, and to go back to that system of, of, her, of a hereditary chief and headman. Can they do it? See, that's the challenge. There hasn't been one reserve that's done it in, in Canada. And are they able to do it? I don't know. It's, it's a, a very challenging idea now. Back then it was normal. A hundred years ago it was normal to have a hereditary chief. Today, with the Indian Act and the election system that many of us grew up under, it's strange. It's a, almost a strange concept, which is unfortunate because that's where our treaties are. That's where our, law, our laws are. And that's where these Ukitsitao school exist, is under those treaties. So that's my suggestion. Now, um, the other thing that I wanted to tell you is um, at the time of treaty signing, um, each reserve in Canada was surveyed. Now, it, this is in the Treaty 6 book. It says there, one square mile per family of five or more. That's how those reserves were, were um, surveyed. Now, if you look at my reserve, I, I'll keep using my reserve because... I'm, I'm familiar with uh, the land mass and everything. At the time of treaty signing, it was, it was 13 by 15. So it was surveyed like that, 13 by 15. And at the time when the treaty commissioner um, allocated the land, when the land was surveyed, they, they uh, surveyed either by 13 families or 15 families, given the 13 by 15. Each family got one square mile per family of five. So when they signed the treaty, they were given their one square mile per family of five. So they all got their one square mile. And at the time, the understanding was that they were going to start farming and living off the land and agriculture. That's another issue, the treaty right to agriculture. No one's really... Um, uh, gone after that treaty right or uh, applied it. The other thing I've, I've heard elders talk about is the, the land is supposed to grow with the population. I heard that growing up all my life and I never really understood it. And elders kept saying the, the land is supposed to grow with the population. Well, how is it supposed to grow? And then when I was in law school, the professors said, well, there's, there's this one way that it could have grown. Since that family 
at the time of treaty signing got uh, one square mile per family of five, that was their piece of land. They had uh, ownership, if you will, over that one square mile. When their children grew up, when that family, their, their children grew up and married, those children would have had children. And when they had their family of five, they were supposed to be allocated their one square mile. And that uh, land base was supposed to grow as the generations grew. So really, when you think about it, um, that one square mile of each reserve uh, were squatters on that family's land, really. We're all living um, off of that land when really it's not ours. It was those people that signed at the time of treaty and it was supposed to grow from there. And that's one of the, the things that was pointed out to me. You know, and that's another, that's another thing that would need to be brought out. And I'm not sure who, who, who could. It, it, it's almost like, well, I mean, it sounds like that they entered, and I say they as like, you know, the British and you know, the Crown entered into the treaty thinking that we were going to be dead within, like, you know, a few years. So, I mean, the, yeah, they the idea did. Of growing land base and uh, yeah. yours blooming forever type rights are kind of uh, unfortunate uh, for them to die you know, off. You know, I mean, it sounds like yeah. a plan anyway. Yeah. Um, I, um, I was curious with the idea of, um, because you mentioned Treaty 6, and it seems that, you know, with each nation's different laws and each nation's, you know, treaty signing, why and, well, why is it that we share a lot of the rights that are in someone's treaty, you know, like the, like the idea of the medicine chest, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's something that everyone claims as a, as a right when if the nations are sovereign from each other why would that cross over why would why would i have health care uh, you know rights when there's no medicine chest in treaty four hmm. is that something that's, well uh, well from what the elders have told me and what they talked about it was since we're all indigenous people you know you can't withhold one since we all have the same indigenous laws and we asked for the, basically the same things at the time of treaty signing. And the other thing, if you look at the treaties as well, um, the government had, had agreed that um, the treaty people would basically have the same agreements. But there are little minor uh, word differences here, here and there. Like in Treaty 4, they have the, the treaty right to ride a train for free. You know, I don't see it happening. You know, the, that law, that treaty right is not extinguished. It's still there. So how come it's not happening? And yet the, that health, uh, that clause for treaty six to health is applied. So there's, there's these really big differences. Um, again, you have to go back to um, that governance structure that we left behind over here. Because those, those under the Indian Act, there's little sporadics of acts of treaty. It looked like the government took uh, uh, little wor words here and there from the treaty book and tried to put it under the Indian Act and call it treaty. But when, when you look at the Indian Act, it's just an arm of the government. Now, in order uh, to understand uh, the Indian Act, you have to go back again to the history of it. In 1644, the Indian Act came into being because um, the government wanted alliance with the Indians as allies uh, within uh, the military. It was a, a part of the military structure. It was never uh, under the government uh, as uh, a policy to assimilate or anything. It didn't start out that way. The Indian Act started out as a, uh, a, an office in the military. 
it was uh, supposed to be a, a, a governing document that's structured how to meet with the Indian allies under the military department. That's how it started out. It was, it just evolved into a system of oppression. Because at the time, in, in, in 1812 and into 1820, you see these changes. And it, ha it had a lot to do with the people that came into power. It, the changes reflected their values and the way that they looked upon Indian people. And that's how the Indian Act uh, evolved. And then next thing you know, they were putting in place the past system and all these different things that caused a lot of oppression. And that's where the residential, uh, res residential schools came to be too. Yeah. So it didn't start out that way. Residential schools weren't treated as they, as they were passed off as, well, that's your education. That's, that's the education we promised you. Yeah, but it didn't say anywhere in a treaty that you'll go to jail if you don't let go of your children. Yeah, but they took the residential school concept from the United States from a man named Peter. I can't remember what his last name is, but he developed the, the concept of residential schools. So they took that from there and brought it here. I, I read, I read, uh, yeah, I wrote so many papers in law school that I, I, I I'm quite familiar with all of that. Interesting. You, uh, you mentioned the, uh, the, uh, uh, the training for free in Treaty 4. When I was coming back from Ottawa, I, I wanted to take the train, so I challenged that. I went down to the CN with my uh, status yeah. card. I was like, well, you know, it's been, uh, it's been reduced to a 15% uh, student discount. It's still, yeah. No. Yeah, oh. yeah. I don't have the money. Let's see. Well, are there things that that you want to, um, you know, I continue on based on your uh, PowerPoint presentation because what what we're looking for, you know, in terms of the bigger project that that you're in is the idea of treaty implementation and how mm -hmm. and, you know how how do we do that present day you know how like you, you know we I mean we spoke about you know living as uh, sovereign people and and it doesn't seem that a lot of people even understand what that means like when, like I mean you ask one person what self governance means well I mean it's completely different than you know, self government mean to another person. So how can or I don't look for a definitive answer from you know, like, you know how yeah. can we do this, but in your view and from what you've been you know, learning from you know, your elders and also from the you know the Western education that you have, is there is there any real hope of legitimate treaty in, like implementation from like from both parties involved? You know what? Um, there's something called, at the international level of law, there's something called comity, and it's spelled C-O-M-I-T-Y. It's, it's uh, a concept at the international level that respects the other nation's laws. It's a friendly relations concept that I respect your international laws of your country and you respect mine. Now, that's not new. That's already recognized at the international level. It's just a matter of believing in, our, in enough in ourselves as a sovereign nation to begin going back to that. Now, I really believe that someday there will be a hereditary chief and hereditary headmen, and it's already been prophesied by many elders that that system of governance will be uh, applied again. It will come back. I don't know what reserve or what nation will bring that process back, but it was foretold that they would. 
And it will be the, at the time when the South, which means uh, the United States, when a different colored president came into power. And we, we, I never knew what that meant, a different colored, I, you know. And now we have Barack Obama. And now the, the elders are saying, okay, now during his time, this president's time, the hereditary chief and headman governance structure will uh, find its way back into Canada because that was the prophecy. I don't know when it'll happen or who, but I, I look forward to that. I'm excited that uh, somebody would bring back that system of governance because that is our inherent system of governance. It worked. It worked really well for our people. If you know, if we have no word for incest and, and all these sexual offenses, something must have worked. And people had such a profound uh, respect for elders and children and, and all these different things. I'm not saying to go back to the teepee. I can't live without my computer. I can't. But it's the idea of how you live your life. It's the idea of following these laws every day in your life. It's when you get up in the morning and choose to be respectful to people and choose to um, follow the laws of how to raise your children. Choose how to be respectful in a kinship manner to elders. Whenever I see elders that I, I know I'm related to a certain way, even if I'm, I don't, uh, I'm not sure of my kinship with them, I'll, clear, I'll make it clear with them. I'll ask them, how am I related to you? And they'll have no hesitation to tell me. There's Alma Kaitoihat. She's my auntie. She's my mother-in-law auntie, so I call her Nsigwas. And I can tease her a certain way. I tell her, you know, where are your sons? You know, because I, I can tease her that way. She is my mother-in-law. And then um, my mother's uh, sisters, if they were still alive, I would call them Ngawis. It means little mother. They're my little mothers. I wouldn't... I, that is the wonderful thing about being indigenous people. We don't ever run out of family. There's always so many people that love and nurture an Indian child. That Indian child was never without family. Now today, we have a hard time finding uh, a family that will take in a foster child. Even the, the, the label of foster child, you know? I've, I've taken in uh, children uh, who have chosen to adopt me along the way in my life, and I prefer to call it kinship parenting, not foster parenting, because it just connotates such a negative label. And I think for many of us, um, we've lost that compassion, that kinship with our children. And we don't welcome them into our home anymore. We don't um, have that relationship with children anymore. And that's harmful to them. When, when we speak about these laws, um, when I speak about them, when the elders tell me about them, they speak about the ceremonies as well. Now, these ceremonies are where these laws are housed. That's where their home is. When you go to a sweat lodge or the Sundance Lodge or the Prairie Chicken Dance Ceremony, all these different ceremonies that are indigenous to the, to the different tribes, you go there and you listen and you see all these laws spoken about and, and they're applied, even the way you approach um, an elder when you go to them with tobacco, that's a law. That's a tradition that you're following that's been in existence for thousands of years as far as I know from what the elders have told me. It's, you know, there's little things that have changed, I'm sure, but the majority of the time when you go to offer an elder um, tobacco, 
you're asking and accessing permission to learn about these laws, to be spoken to. And in these ceremonies, um, when, when, I, when I talked to the elders, they said that if we're, if we're going to find similarities, then it would be the courtrooms. Now, it's not ex exactly the same as courtrooms, not the, the European concept of it, but the courtrooms in European, European context, that's where they, they do the judge and jury and they apply the laws, the remedy and the consequences. So the ceremonies are similar in that thought pattern. But when a person breaks a law, they're considered um, unhealthy. They're unwell. Something is wrong. Something needs to be corrected. So what I, I've translated is they, the ceremonies are the corrective force to correct that person. So, for example, if a young person was caught stealing uh, food from a neighboring uh, teepee or a neighboring person, they would be told, so you, you think that you're man enough to steal food, then you will learn to hunt. So they're taken by the warriors in that community and they're taken out to learn to hunt and to replace that food. There's something, uh, a sickness within them that needs to be corrected if they're taking food and stealing food, then the community has done has a responsibility to correct that. Now, I've heard of, uh, I've learned about the sentencing circles. Now, there's a whole process that's being missed uh, before you get to the sentencing circles. That's the very end of it. This whole process here is being missed. You have to teach th these children about these laws, what they've broken, what are the consequences. Now, and then you go put them through the ceremonies. And then the, in those ceremonies, uh, those okitsitao skok, the, the clan mothers decide which ceremony would be appropriate uh, after they, they decide or identify, after they identify what law has been broken and the community speaks about it. And, and then they decide, okay, yeah, this law has been broken, stealing. So that law has been broken. So they go ahead and say, okay, so this child, this young person needs to go in fast. They need to do their, their vision quest or they, they need to go and, and learn from another particular elder about the sweat lodge and the laws governing the sweat lodge. There's a remedy that's identified in that, that process. But if that young person or that individual um, doesn't learn and they keep breaking the law, every, every chance they get, they break the law and they're not learning and they're not obeying and they're not listening to what they're taught. That's when the circle is used, the sentencing circle. That's when a community comes together and the extreme punishment is used. It's either death or banishment. That's when that circle is utilized. So for this circle to be utilized in this contemporary um, Canadian system, they've missed uh, that whole journey here. They've missed that. And I've been uh, a participant of these circles. They work, you know, but um, they don't apply the Indigenous laws and they certainly don't um, speak about the Indigenous laws. I haven't been to a, a circle where these laws speak about um, uh, the laws of kinship, the laws of um, bringing up your children. You know, there's that each person that sits at this uh, circle has to be able to speak about these laws. The thing about um, the indigenous laws is there's several people that have a role within uh, the community of, of or a nation. They have a role to play. And I, I mentioned uh, the hereditary chiefs, the headmen, the Okitsitao school. 
with Scott Busak and the women helpers. There's men and women helpers that have a very strong role because they're, they're the ones that begin to be apprenticed to take on the, the other roles within the, the nation. Um, we don't have that anymore as well. We do. There are sporadic uh, uh, people who are still utilizing it and they're still using it within their community. So our laws are still alive. They're still um, very much spoken about. And the elders that I talk to, they're, they're just so sad that our young people are not no longer speaking a language. And how are we going to speak about these laws if we're not teaching our children um, the languages? There, it's easy, easier maybe to follow the Canadian legal system of law, but you also have to recognize that it's not our system of law. Our, our law and governance and, and the things that we've been given to follow are still there. And I hope that um, someday that as a nation, as a sovereign nation, our young people in the future, the future leaders will begin to question why should we recognize the Canadian legal system as the process of leadership. It isn't. You go all over the world. China has a perfectly good system and they still honor their traditional uh, structures and and it's going well for them, I think. They're one of the, the up and coming nations and they still follow a lot of their traditions. And then there's um, um, Russia, you know, all these different nations that have their own system of governance. Canadian law is not the all be all kind of, you know, law and governance. And there's wonderful work being done at the UN right now. Um, there's the, United, uh, the Declaration of the Indigenous Rights, the Indigenous People's Rights. And in there it says the right to self-determination, the right to recognize their Indigenous laws. Now that's, that's um, wonderful. That is such a wonderful empowerment for Indigenous people. It once again says Indigenous people had their laws. They're not gone. They're not going to disappear. Not as long as there's people like me going out there and just saying we have our laws. We have to follow them. We can't go to the government, federal government table and say, okay, you know, We'll, we'll follow your laws and, and we'll still be sovereign people. Uh, how can that happen? It's like me going to Italy and taking their laws and coming to the table and, say, and saying that I'm a sovereign nation, but I'm using Italy's laws. You know, it doesn't work. And especially at the time of treaty signing, we had our laws. They were already there and we were using them at the time of treaty signing. It's just right now, we, we don't have uh, enough people who have that understanding. So I encourage the young people who may be listening to this uh, conversation, this sharing, to think critically about your history. Think about your heritage. Where do you come from? If an elder were to go up to you and ask you, who are your family? What is your lineage? Are you able to answer it? If you don't have an understanding of the treaties, if you don't have an understanding of our laws, then you've lost that idea of sovereignty and leadership. Our leaders a long time ago at the time of treaty signing and a lot of them, um, the elders know this, they had a very strict system of leadership. It was filled with honor and truth and dignity and respect and a servitude for their people. 
it's it's been eroded over time it's not gone those concept are, concepts are still there and those laws are still there this is a matter of understanding them and believing in them and then bringing back into our way of of governance our way of leading ourselves to become uh, going back to our, our sovereignty and when you go back into that system of treaty that idea of a, a, a hereditary uh, chiefs and headmen we never gave up our resources there has to be plain and plain and clear intent to extinguish that's what the Canadian law says there has to be clear and plain intent nowhere in the treaty does it say that we gave up our resources to land, to water, to the trees, the minerals? Nowhere in it does it say that. So who, whichever hereditary chief and headmen are, are prophesied to come back into this leadership structure are going to um, have uh, powerful challenges ahead of them because they're going, they will have the authority with the Ukitsitao school to access the challenge of bringing back those resources, the ownership to them.